The great Nobel laureate Steven Weinberg once said that physics thrives on crisis. And in 1989 he said physics was short on crises. But luckily for us today, physics is chock full of them. We're gonna talk about possibly two cosmic conundrums. Come along into the impossible. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I've talked with Adam Reese, another Nobel laureate, about the so-called Hubble tension. And that seems to indicate that the agreements between the early universe measurements of the Hubble constants and the late universe measurements of the Hubble constant differ, a difference that is irreconcilable. Now, astronomers have found a possible resolution to the Hubble tension that relies on nothing more exotic than your kitchen's refrigerator magnet. Astronomers are used to measuring magnetic fields. They pervade the cosmos. There's even a magnetic field of, associated with your body, and birds use magnetic fields to navigate. The Earth has a magnetic field. The solar system has a magnetic field. Our galaxy has a magnetic field. The clusters of galaxies that we observe have magnetic fields. The question is, is there a primordial or fundamental cosmic primordial magnetic field? Recently, a radio galaxy survey by the LOFAR collaboration discovered a, a massive magnetic field pervading dozens or maybe hundreds of galaxies. And the question is, how could you get such a ginormous magnetic field pervading not just a single galaxy, but hundreds or dozens of hundreds, thousands of galaxies at the same time? What are galaxy clusters? And why are they so important to the study of magnetic fields? Well, galaxy clusters are the most massive of all cosmic objects that are so-called gravitationally bound. They're associated in the same way that the Earth is associated with the Sun by the force of gravity. And they're in motion. In this case, they're associated by the forces primarily of gravity due to the dark matter that surrounds these galaxies. And in fact, their properties led Zwicky back in the 1930s to conjecture the existence of so-called dark matter, validated by Vera Rubin. These galaxy clusters grow by accreting small structures onto bigger ones. In the process of gobbling up smaller and smaller galaxies to make a more massive and massive galaxy cluster, uh, they emit low frequency radio wave emission. And that's due to the charge particles, mainly the electrons, that move in magnetic fields of these galaxies. We can detect the motion of those electrons, the emission in the radio frequency, and use that to, as a proxy to measure the uh, magnetic field that caused these electrons to move with the accelerations that they're observed. When the LOFAR scientist, as discussed in this paper shown here, described a measurement of this massive galaxy cluster, they were overwhelmed by the size of the implied magnetic field permeating these galaxy clusters. So they sought out computer simulations to predict how large a magnetic field a cosmic cluster of galaxies should exhibit. One possibility would be that it had been essentially created earlier on in the cosmic history, maybe back primordially closer to the Big Bang than ever thought possible before. Now, this question has bearing not only on the aspects of the formation of galaxies and clusters and their magnetic fields, but also on the problem of whether or not the universe's expansion rate is really different at early times versus late times. For if there were an early magnetic field in the universe, that could help to resolve why the measurements of the universe's expansion rate, the Hubble constant, at early times via cosmic microwave background measurements differ so violently with those by late time observers such as Adam Reese and Wendy Friedman and others uh, that measure the Hubble constant using galaxies as we observe them at low redshift. My colleague and friend, Levon Pagosian at Simon Fraser University, suggested that we might not need to appeal to exotic physics, the new type of, of energy or mass or matter, but rather just to invoke something that we know and love from our uh, kitchen refrigerator, namely magnetic fields. What magnet? What about it? Cosmologists have known that magnetic fields play an important role in all gravitationally bound systems, but they didn't know if there were any unbound magnetic fields, magnetic fields not associated with clusters. And magnetic fields have fascinated scientists since the year 1600, when the first scientific study by William Gilbert uh, looked at the properties of lodestones. These are naturally occurring magnetized rocks that people have been using uh, as compasses. He conjectured back in the 1600s in his famous book called The Magnet, uh, that perhaps the magnetic force originates from a type of force field that he called uh, reminiscent of a soul. Ooh. Uh, but he correctly did summarize that the Earth possesses a property that makes it effectively a great magnet, and that lodestones will lock towards the poles of the Earth. 
Now the question is, can you get a non-dynamic, in other words, not a rotational generation force for the magnetic field in the universe? So magnetic fields are ubiquitous. They essentially are unblockable. They can only be blocked by things like superconductors and laboratory generated cancellation fields that we do use uh, throughout our experiments. So you can't really shield it, so they pervade everything. So they can reach out across vast distances in the cosmos. Now an interesting study done over a decade ago published what's called a lower limit on the amount of cosmic magnetism. This is fascinating. By looking at the non-observation of what are called TEV blazars and their halos, we don't see an effect how one would expect to see around very distant blazars, which are highly energetic uh, nuclei of active ga galaxies, that these blazars would produce a halo due to positron-electron uh, annihilation that we've talked about in other videos. Uh, but that phenomenon would lead to a burst of gamma radiation that we should see surrounding these distant objects. The fact that we don't observe these halos led to a lower limit on the amount of cosmic magnetic field energy present when these blazars are in their active phase. This magnetic field would cause the divergence of positron-electron pairs, because they're opposite charge. We could use that non-observation to say there is a magnetic field close to these blazars, which themselves are at high redshift. Therefore, there is strong evidence for a minimum amount of cosmic magnetic field energy pervading our universe. Now, how did that get there? That is, of course, an open question. Looking for the signals as observed by LOFAR implies that these galaxy clusters have enormous amounts of magnetic energy and that they are also at great distance and therefore great time and look back sense from our observational vantage point on Earth. So, the LOFAR team doesn't know for sure what caused the magnetic field to permeate the filaments that they saw. I should point out that we in the cosmic microwave background community are also very interested in the existence of magnetic fields. And in principle, we could go far, far back because the CMB is produced at a time when the universe was only 0.003% of its current age, or 380,000 years out of 14 billion years, roughly. So we can perhaps go back to the very primordial essence of the universe using the cosmic microwave background. And this has been a hope for both my friend and colleague Levon Pagosian, as well as my friend and colleague Hanme Vakaspati at Arizona State University. Back in 1991, Tanmay conjectured that magnetic fields could have arisen during what's known as the electroweak phase transition. This is the time roughly less than a millisecond or two after the Big Bang when the electromagnetic force and the weak nuclear force were unified into one force, or before that they were unified, and after that time period, after electroweak uh, unification ended, we then manifest different phenomena as electricity and magnetism. Whether or not the earliest magnetic field energy could produce a predictable pattern in the primordial soup, the primordial plasma, protons and electrons, if they could actually spin up the very first magnetic fields. This is another conjecture that has gone on for a long time. So we need to push back even farther back in time beyond the massive and tremendous success of the LOFAR instrument. That can only probe, you know, out to redshifts of a few where these clusters of galaxies exist. We need to go back factors of a thousand more in redshift, and that is potentially only observable using the cosmic microwave background. To detect the existence of a primordial magnetic field using the cosmic microwave background radiation, we would employ its polarization. And it's interesting, all the successes of the CMB to date have all been measured without application or appeal to using CMB's polarization. But now this could only be gotten out by measuring what's called the Faraday effect, which is allied with the birefringence effect that I spoke about in this video over here. The amount of Faraday rotation of the plane of electromagnetic polarization depends very crucially on the amount of electrons that are present in a plasma, but also the amount of magnetic field. So you can directly measure the strength of magnetism by measuring how much polarization rotation takes place. But looking for Faraday rotation in the cosmic microwave background radiation is no easy feat. It does require ultra-sensitive measurements of the cosmic microwave background's E-mode and B-mode polarization states, as well as the correlation between them. And it is somewhat degenerate with this type of birefringent effect that we spoke about in earlier videos and we'll continue to speak about. Nevertheless, it is quite interesting that we can look for these signatures in many, many different 
wavelength regimes. We can look at low frequency radio emission. We can look for gamma ray emission or the lack of gamma ray emission surrounding these TeV blazars. And that measurement it can also be combined, those measurements, at low frequency radio emission, extremely high gamma ray emission. We can use that in combination with millimeter wave microwave measurements, such as that as going to be produced by the Simons Observatory, can combine to give us a narrower and narrower parameter space over which cosmic magnetism could arise. So this is quite fascinating. Whether or not these magnetic fields, which are known to exist throughout the cosmos, on the smallest scales of you and me, all the way up to cosmic uh, galaxy clusters, and perhaps even beyond, that those measurements could lead to an understanding of what happened at extremely early times, as if it weren't enough to go back billions of years with galaxy clusters, uh, eight billion years back to the cosmic microwave background, we could go back to perhaps microseconds, or maybe even billionths of a second after the Big Bang, if indeed some phase transition is responsible for the origin of matter. So, how does all of this relate to the so-called Hubble tension that exists between cosmic microwave background measurements of the universe's expansion rate 380,000 years after the Big Bang, and the late time, relatively late time, say billions of years after the Big Bang? Magnetic fields produce a very particular type of energy. It's called a stress energy. The type of stress energy that's produced by an early magnetic field can also contribute to the Friedman equations that we've talked about in previous videos, and that can cause the universal expansion rate, which we call the Hubble constant, it can cause that to vary over time. And so you can ask the Hubble constant today, and you can compare it to what the Hubble constant would be evaluated when the CMB was uh, was produced 380,000 years after the Big Bang. And you compare those two and they are discrepant. How does this come into play? Could be that there was excess energy in the form of primordial magnetic fields that were, again, implanted by an as yet unknown mechanism. But these primordial magnetic fields would cause the universe to expand somewhat faster at early times. And so we could look and compare these two co these cosmic expansion rates and we could ask the question as to whether or not the discrepancy is caused not by some exotic force or field, quintessence, dark energy evolving, but it could be a very prosaic solution. One that involves you going no farther than your kitchen refrigerator to appreciate, namely a primordial cosmic magnetic field.